All right, welcome to Hoops Tonight, presented by FanDuel here at The Volume. Happy Thursday, everybody. We have almost made it to the weekend. Going to keep it nice and simple today. Three teams. We're going to be talking about the Phoenix Suns, who are on a six-game win streak, the Milwaukee Bucks, who are on a three-game win streak, and the Los Angeles Lakers, who have won six out of eight. Should be seven out of eight, as all you Lakers fans know. Keep it simple on those three teams. And the rest of the week, tomorrow we're doing our quarter-season awards And then Saturday morning, we'll have a breakdown of the Friday night slate, which is jam-packed. You guys know the drill before we get started. Subscribe to the Volumes YouTube channel so you don't miss any more of our videos. Follow me on Twitter at underscore JasonLT so you don't miss any show announcements. I'm also going to once again reference two sets of clips that I put together to demonstrate points that I'm making on today's show. So you're going to want to follow me at underscore JasonLT on Twitter to see those video clips. And then last but not least, if for whatever reason you guys miss one of these videos and you can't get back over to YouTube to finish, remember you can find them wherever you get your podcasts under hoops tonight. All right, let's talk some basketball. So the Phoenix Suns are on a six-game winning streak. They are now first in the Western Conference at 15-6 and despite being without Chris Paul for the last, what, like month or so? Um, they're second in offense, sixth in defense for the season, second in net rating for the season. And then during this six game winning streak, Devin Booker puts up 51 last night in just three quarters in just 31 minutes and on just 25 shots with just five misses in this six game winning streak. He's averaging 31, seven and five on 61% true shooting. He's a bona fide superstar. We're going to spend a bunch of time talking about him here in just a minute. And then DeAndre Ayton has also been outstanding during the stretch, 22-14 and 14 during the six-game streak. Four offensive rebounds per game and 70% true shooting. He's also done a really nice job passing out of the short roll um, during the stretch of games as well. So I wanted to talk about Devin Booker for a little bit because, you know, the, uh, it's really hard in this league to shake your perception as a basketball player. I've even been dealing with this a little bit with Lakers fans where, like, you know, your opinion about whether or not Russ deserves to be traded is one thing, but the Russ we're seeing this year is not the same player as last year. Last year, there was a lot less good and a lot a lot more bad. And this year, there's a lot more good and a lot less bad. So he's gone from being a net negative player to a net positive player. And there are a lot of Lakers fans who are talking the same way about Russ now as they did last season. And, you know, my, my thing has been, uh, you know, uh, that he's doing better in this bench role and it's more of a product of you wanting to use his salary as a vehicle with which to improve the roster. Last year, it was like, Russ just isn't playing very well. But that perception is tough to shake. Sometimes it takes years and years and years. And Devin Booker is a great example of this because he scored a lot of points for really bad Suns teams for a while. And then he scored a lot of points on really good Suns teams for a while that flamed out in the playoffs year after year, including even in their most successful season, blowing a 2-0 lead to the Milwaukee Bucks in the finals. And so there's kind of like this reputation that surrounds Devin Booker that he's just a scorer. And it just could not be any further from the truth, especially this season. And I've been talking about this nonstop since, uh, since the first few weeks of the season, but Devin's improvements as a passer and as a defender have turned him into a a bona fide superstar. He's no longer a guy that you're lumping in with that tier of stars that fills between, you know, number 11 in the league and like number 30 in the league. He's not like that anymore. He's above that tier. He is now every bit as good as the players we're talking about at the top of the league. And, you know, even after nights like last night, People will fo- once again focus like Devin Booker is a bucket. Look at him; he got he got fifty, you know, and that's going to be the hyper focus. But he's been so good in those other details of game of the game. I wanted to take some time to highlight that right now. So first of all, the Suns are down Chris Paul, they're down Jay Crowder, and they're down Cam Johnson. That's two starters from this year and another starter from last year. So they're pretty thin on the wing. They're down one of their most important ball handlers. And yet, despite that, this season, when Devin Booker is off the floor, they're getting outscored by 1.4 points per 100 possessions. And when he's on the floor, they're plus 10 points per 100 possessions. That's superstar level differential. 
The Suns have scored 366 points on 344 Devin Booker pick and rolls this season, which is 1.06 points per possession, which is in the 78th percentile. He's not just a scorer anymore. He is a bona fide offensive engine. Now, what does that mean? Now, uh, an offensive engine is different from a scorer in the sense that scorers might feel comfortable in specific matchups or in specific spots on the floor. And if you can get them in those spots, they can make plays. I'll give you an example, like Kyle Kuzma. Kyle Kuzma, if you get him in the right matchup and he's feeling good, he can score the basketball. But you're not going to use Kyle Kuzma as an offensive fulcrum, right? Devin Booker is a play that you can run 344 pick and rolls. That's incredibly high volume compared to a lot of the primary ball handlers in the league. You can run your entire offense through him. And that's why I wanted to uh, point back to this, uh, what I believe was the most impressive game from the Suns during this win streak, and that was their win up in Sac- in Sacramento. Now, the uh, Kings went up, I, th- I want to say it was like 115 to 112, late, or it might have been 105-102, uh, about midway through the fourth quarter. And after that, the Suns just dominated down the stretch. And there was a string of eight consecutive possessions. After Damian Lee hit a nice little step back jump shot to bring it back to 105, 104, there was a stretch of eight consecutive possessions where Devin Booker uh, generated extremely high quality shots. And the Suns went from down by one to up by 10, like that, to win a huge game on the road against a very good team. So I wanted to kind of break down the possessions because Devin, uh, uh, Devin Booker only took two shots during that eight possession stretch and generated these extremely high quality looks. That's why I wanted to highlight that stretch because it kind of points to that um, that larger topic that I'm, that I'm trying to hit at here, which is Devin Booker is not a scorer anymore. He's an offensive engine. So he started, with, he started it off with a pick and roll with DeAndre Ayton. And on the possession, Davion Mitchell fought over the top of the screen and cut Devin Booker off. But all the Kings defenders stayed back and helped. And Devin Booker has a size advantage over Davion Mitchell. So he hit him with a hard dribble, hit him with his right shoulder, spun back towards the middle, and knocked down a really nice turnaround jump shot. Then, very next possession, another eight and pick and roll. This time he gets trapped. And Kevin Herter helps out of the corner to tag DeAndre Ayton when he's rolling to the basket. So... Um, Devin Booker just throws a quick swing pass to Torrey Craig, who makes a quick extra pass to Damian Lee in the corner, knocks down a three. So that's an example of Devin Booker creating the initial advantage due to his ability to make plays out of pick and roll and draw multiple defenders. Very next possession. Same thing, pick and roll with Aiton. This time he gets trapped again, hits Aiton on the short roll. The Kings tag Aiton on the short roll. Damian Lee kind of loops around from the left, uh, from the right wing, gets another wide open three, and knocks it down. Very next possession, same exact thing, another trap. This time they tagged Aiton a little bit sooner, so Devin Booker makes the adjustment and goes directly to Damian Lee instead of hitting the short roll first. It gets a pretty decent look. He just happens to miss it. Then on the very next possession, they run a horn set, and on this horn set. Uh, Devin Booker uh, comes over an eight and screen at the elbow and he sees, so at, so uh, um, they're on opposite ends of the, the, um, the elbows on the horn set, eight and screens for Booker as he comes over the top. But Sabonis was hugged up to Aiton and you could see Booker like staring right at Sabonis and he knows that because Davion Mitchell's behind him and because Sabonis is up at the elbow, that there's nobody at the rim. Mikael Bridges cuts off of him in like one of those Spurs cuts off of that high post catch and just hands it to him because he knows Mikael Bridges' defender is trailing him and there's no help help at the rim because Sabonis isn't there. It was a great read from Devin Booker. Mikael Bridges goes right in and gets a dunk. Very next possession, another pick and roll with Aiton, another trap. This time they were too slow to tag Aiton because they had been leaving shooters open and Aiton gets a reverse layup. Next possession, horn set again. Donovan Mitchell gets caught a little bit, or excuse me, Davion Mitchell gets caught a little bit on the switch. And so Devin Booker just elevates. Davion Mitchell recovers too aggressively and fouls Devin Booker. He goes to the foul line. And then the last possession, they blitz Devin Booker on a pick and roll along the right wing. He drags the double out to about 30 feet. Kevin Herter leaves Mikhail Bridges to tag Aiton. Once again, swings to, t- uh, to Torrey Craig. Torrey Craig, extra pass to Mikhail Bridges in the corner. Knocks down a three. Now it's a 10-point game. 
So again, and I put all eight of those possessions on Twitter. So you're going to want to go there so you can actually see the footage because that's going to do it's going to do more justice than me talking about it. But it, I thought it was a really impressive stretch of high level surgical half court offensive creation from a guy who has the reputation of being just a score. Took two shots, a couple of pull-up jump shots, both of them in situations where it was the right read. On the first one, there was no help. He had a good matchup. And on the second one, Davion Mitchell got caught on the screen and he had a good look at it. So that, that's a superstar. That's not a score. That's not an empty stats guy. That's a superstar. And that's why the Suns are the best team in the West right now, despite some awful injury luck to start the year. You know, Devin Booker's leap has to change the way we evaluate the Suns because originally I talked about the Suns as a team that was incredibly deep with talent. Mikhail Bridges is so good. DeAndre Ayton is so good. Cam Johnson will be back at some point this season. He's so good. Torrey Craig's been playing pretty well for them. Cam Payne can get great dribble penetration. You know, they've got uh, Landry Shamit, you know, is, is a good bench uh, guard that can make plays defensively and knock down shots. They've got a lot of talent. But we were worried about their top-end talent. And Devin Booker going from guy who can score, play a little bit of defense, and do a little bit of playmaking to really well-rounded superstar makes it so that the Suns can hang in with the top teams in the league in terms of top-end talent. If you have Booker with that type of supporting cast, he can hang with any of the stars in the league. So that a really impressive stretch of basketball from the Suns, and I'm, I wanted to take some time to shout out Devin Booker. All right, moving on to the Bucks. So they've won three in a row, including a couple of really impressive wins against Dallas and Cleveland. They are up to 15-5, and five, just two games back of Boston, who's been running away with everything this, uh, this season. They are 17th in offense still, first in defense and fifth in net rating. Pat Connaughton's been back for about a week, almost two weeks now. Uh, de- definitely looks a little rusty and out of rhythm, but that's to be expected. That will come around once you get into real basketball shape. All of a sudden, you get better lift on those jumpers. Um, Chris Middleton, it's been reported, is coming back on Friday against the Lakers. I think that's the perfect game for him to come back um, and kind of and kind of get eased back into NBA basketball. The Lakers offer a ton of strong side help, and they're absolutely going to pack the paint on Giannis. So Giannis is going to generate a lot of good looks for him on kickouts, and then the Laker wings are all shorter than me. So um, Chris Middleton is going to have a lot of really good matchups to shoot over the top of smaller Laker defenders. Um, So I I think that Friday game is going to be a really good opportunity for, for Chris to kind of get his, uh, 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 get his feet dirty playing NBA basketball again. They're playing great basketball. Even without those guys though, Javon Carter and Grayson Allen can't miss a damn three to save their lives. And they're both defending really well. Brooke Lopez is utterly wrecking teams with his rim protection and his three point shooting in our mid season awards that we're going to do tomorrow, excuse me, our quarter season awards that we're going to do tomorrow. I haven't decided yet because I'm considering a couple other guys, but I'm strongly considering making Brooke Lopez my defensive player of the year so far. And then Giannis, like there was a nine game stretch in early November where he was clearly banged up. He was dealing with knee stuff. He only played in six out of the nine games. He shot under 50% in all six games. He only averaged 25, 11 and six on 42% shooting. Although it kind of reminds me of LeBron where like the bad stretches of Giannis are 25, 11 and six. Like, That's just completely absurd, but he's completely back in his groove now. In his last five games, he scored 30-plus every single one of them. 36, 10, and 6 is his average during that stretch on 59% shooting, so whatever was going on is gone. Um, It looked like it was almost personal last night between him and Julius Randle. He was really physically aggressive with him on both ends of the floor. You know, one of the th- one of the reasons why I have Giannis as the best player in the world is even though I consider him just a top tier offensive player and not like the best offensive player, like I think Steph Curry is a much better offensive player than Giannis Antetokounmpo. I think it's a big part of why um, the Bucks struggle to score in the half court. Uh, but the combination of Giannis being a very very good offensive player and the best defensive player in the world is why I think he's the best player in the world, and. <clears throat> The reason why I think he's the best defensive player in the world is like when we look at, you know, the traditional great rim protectors, like even Brooke, like Brooke, I'm considering him for defensive player of the year through quarter of the season. You know, it's a lot of scheme stuff with him. They're keeping him by the paint. And at that specific thing, he's one of the very best in the league. Brooke Lopez is just an outstanding rim protector. 
But, you know, they don't have Giannis in that spot. Giannis can do that, and they slot him in there when Brooks off the floor. Like, that was kind of the way they dealt with Julius Randle last night. When Brooke was out there, Giannis was on Julius Randle. When Brooke would go off, they'd slide Giannis to the five, and they'd put, you know, Bobby Portis on Julius Randle, have Giannis hang out around the rim. That type of, versati- that type of versatility is, is the key, because obviously we know what Giannis can do as a backline rim protector, but it's what he can do on ball. He was navigating screens as the Knicks tried to free Julius Randle up, legitimately bothering Julius with his length, Held him to eight as a team. They held him to eight for twenty-four shooting. But in those isolation possessions or individual defense possessions on Julius, I thought he really did a nice job bothering him. Not just forcing misses, but some bad misses, some air balls and and hard bricks off the glass. That that's the the, the part of it that is um, that's a separator for me with Giannis is like. He has the ability to do perimeter defense stuff as well as most of the big wings that we have in the league, and he can be a foundational rim protector for you if you need him to. I am really excited for this game on Sunday, or excuse me, on Friday. Milwaukee is going to get the Lakers' best punch because the Lakers want to prove that they're legit, um, and it's a it's it's just a super interesting matchup, right? Because like Milwaukee's twenty first in half court offense, and the Lakers are second in half court defense. You know, so uh, it, it, the, they should struggle to score. But then on the other end of the court, Milwaukee is first in half court defense, and the Lakers are 18th in half court offense. So you know, both teams are going to be desperate to get out and transition as much as possible in the half court. It's going to be an absolute slugfest. Chris Middleton should have advantages all night, like I was talking about shooting over the top of smaller Laker uh, wings. And then LeBron and Anthony Davis are two of the best bodies that you can possibly throw on Giannis. So. Um, it'll be really interesting to see how much help they send. My guess is Darvin Ham will overhelp. So it'll come down to Bucks role players making shots and at home. There's a really interesting thing just in general going on around the league right now where all of the really good teams are thriving at home and struggling on the road. Like like even the Suns that we talked about earlier are really struggling on the road. So <clears throat> Um, I, my, my prediction for Friday night is that the Bucks role players hit a bunch of threes and they end up winning by 10, 15 points, but it should be a very, very interesting game. Bucks fans that are listening, you're going to want to come back tomorrow for our mid season awards because the Bucks will be heavily featured. And then also on Saturday morning when we do a game breakdown from that Friday night game. All right. On to the Lakers. So really nice balance back win last night. Um, against the Portland Trailblazers. First of all, they were down Lonnie Walker, who's been their third best player this year. And they were down Troy Brown Jr., who's been arguably their best defensive wing this year. So from a personnel standpoint, they were really limited. It was basically LeBron and Anthony Davis and a bunch of small guards. Um, And they also had a really, really crushing loss on Monday. Like, you got to think about how crushing that was. They had won five out of six before that game. And then they were up 17 in the fourth quarter. So... They could. That was their opportunity to really string together a stretch of good basketball, and they let their foot off the gas, and the basketball gods made them pay for it. Um, but I don't think it's indicative of who they are as a team, um, because the you know the real team is the team that you've seen over the course of the last couple of weeks, which is a team that competes like crazy, and they've got some old veteran players that have to learn the hard way that they can't let their foot off the gas, and they've let their foot off the gas twice this year, ironically against the Blazers the first time. And then on Monday night, <clears throat> and so as long as they've learned their lesson there, they should be okay. But they came back, and like when you make a catastrophic mistake like that, there's only one thing you can do, and it's just put one foot right fr- right back in front of the other and go out and play good basketball the next time out the floor. You know, there's, a, there's an old cliche, winning cures everything. That's the truth. Like if you win against the Blazers on Wednesday night, <clears throat> and you go into Milwaukee and you beat the Bucks on Friday, not only does that completely erase the painfulness of that Monday loss, now you've won seven out of your last nine games and you beat you know the second or third best team in the league on the road. So that's the type of potential that's there for the Lakers on Friday, and that's the only way you can recover from that type of devastating loss. So I want to talk about LeBron for a second. So that we're going to hit on three Lakers, LeBron, uh, Russell Westbrook, and Austin Reeves. So LeBron had a really tough first shift. You know, one of the big reasons why Russell Westbrook has been so good for the Lakers this year is he just brings energy. He brings like a, a verve. 
he changes the pace of the game, and he gets a ton of dribble penetration, which gets the Lakers into their driving kick, and that's when they start getting good stuff. And LeBron, too often this year, has been too passive, just kind of slowly and methodically bringing the ball up the floor. There is a time and place for that. There are times when that methodical approach will actually disrupt the opponent as long as you're getting good shots and knocking them down, as long as LeBron, especially when he's shooting the way that he is, like there's versions of that that can work, but you need to bring some verve to get the team, uh, you know, playing at a pace that uh, that keeps them free and, and, and generating quality shots. And in that first shift, he just wasn't doing it. And then Russ came in and, and changed the pace of this game in the, uh, uh, in the early first quarter. And when LeBron came back in, his entire demeanor was different. And this is a credit to Russell Westbrook. I think I think Russell Westbrook opening up that game with pace clicked for LeBron that he needed to do the same thing. And when he came out in that second quarter or in the second shift, excuse me, he had a completely different level of energy and ended up playing his best game of the season. Did a really nice job defending Jeremy Grant. This was the second uh, set of video clips that I put together that you're going to want to find on Twitter at underscore Jason LT. I clipped all 15 of these possessions, but there were 15 possessions that Jeremy Grant attempted to make a play with LeBron James as his primary defender. Not only was it 15 possessions, it was 15 complicated possessions. Almost every single time, they were either bringing Jeremy Grant out of the corner and making LeBron chase him over the top of a wide pin down, or they were doing like an X dribble handoff. A lot in the fourth quarter they did this, but like a X dribble handoff at the top of the key to try to get... Jeremy Grant an advantage as LeBron had to navigate a screen. So LeBron was always having to navigate a screen to then get into place to defend Jeremy Grant. And on those 15 uh, possessions, he held Jeremy Grant to 4 out of 14 shooting from the field with an assist. A a really nice job navigating screens, defending, uh, uh, pressing up on Jeremy Grant's shot, giving up a couple of layups on drives from Jeremy Grant, knowing that over the grand scheme of the game with his help defense – by pressing up on his jump shot, he would get him to have a rough shooting night. That's what ended up happening. Um, forced Jeremy into a lot of contested pull-up jump shots that he ended up missing. You know, I talked about this a lot uh, in our uh, Wednesday, Tuesday show that was disastrous with the uh, uh, with the technical difficulties. Apologies again. Uh, I was really irritated that night, as you guys could probably imagine. <laughs> but uh, anyway, when we were talking that night, I was talking about how you know, when LeBron's going through offensive slumps, which is a natural part of coming back from injuries. Like we talked about that on Tuesday night. It was like his third game in 20 days. So obviously he wasn't going to be in rhythm to look like MVP LeBron, but there are things that are under your control, your decision-making and your effort. And LeBron made some pretty inexcusable effort mistakes and decision-making mistakes during that, uh, that Monday game. And In this game, he devoted a great deal of energy to getting back in transition defense, defending the best player or second best player, depending on how you feel about Anthony Simons, defending the other team's, uh, you know, best scoring wing. And then he also had to grade an offensive game, which is great. But the Lakers win that game, even if LeBron doesn't shoot as well as he did, because he took care of the stuff that he needed to control, which is what he does on the defensive end of the floor. Um, I wanted to talk about the importance of LeBron's jumper for a second because, you know, I always talk about dribble penetration. Dribble penetration is a combination of your ability to athletically beat people with your first step and your ability to knock down jump shots to force the defender to be more on his toes rather than on his heels, right? Those, those, that dynamic is a really delicate balance and, you know, you're, you can make up for a lot of physical limitations if you're making shots. You know, for instance, Steph Curry is an underrated athlete, and we've talked about that a lot. You know, his conditioning is ridiculous. He's pretty quick with his feet, and he's surprisingly big, even though a lot of people think of him as a small guard. Um, but he he's one of the best rim finishers in basketball, and a big part of that is he weaponizes his shot to get clean driving lanes and clean driving lanes give you the versatility to go to all your different finishing moves and things like that. And, you know, LeBron doesn't look athletically what he was early in the season and uh, in last season. And that will probably come over the course of the next couple of weeks. But he manufactured a bunch of dribble penetration last night by hitting shots. You know, you you saw the, the, the clear one where 
um, where he pump faked and Jeremy Grant came out and he threw that rifle pass to, I think it was Wenyan Gabriel, I can't remember, but some Laker that was in the block. And then he cut uh, immediately after the pass and got a dunk. So that's a driving dunk generated by the threat of his shot. There was another one in the late fourth quarter uh, uh, where he pump faked uh, got in, uh, got a step on the defender because of the pump fake. The defender left his feet, and he threw a no-look pass to Austin Reeves in the right corner for a three-point shot. And then there was a third one. I can't remember the exact details, but there were three plays in that game where LeBron created dribble penetration with the threat of his jump shot. And so, you know, his legs will come around and his athleticism will allow him to manufacture even more dribble penetration, but him making those three-point shots is so important for him to be successful in the meantime. And like we talked about with Russell Westbrook, and we're going to talk about more in a minute, that dribble penetration in, in pace is so important for the Lakers to avoid that stagnant half-court environment where they can't score because they don't have enough shooting. And so it's it's good to see LeBron, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, making some shots to buy him some leeway on that front. You know, I was really critical of LeBron on Monday. Uh, he's my favorite player of all time. But, you know, this is the standard that I hold him to. You are the leader of this team. You know, I will. if you have a game where you go out and you struggle to make shots because you're out of shape, because you're coming back from injury, I will never say a damn word. Um, I'll call it what it is, which is a, a basketball player rebuilding his rhythm. But when you don't run back on defense and you make poor decisions as one of the best decision makers in the history of the league, to me, that's the leader of the Lakers not doing his job. And he and he didn't do his job on Monday. But again, just like we talked about from a team-wide uh, scale, the only thing you can do in that situation is continue to put one foot in front of the other and go out and play a good basketball game on Wednesday. And that's what he did. You know, he also happened to have a great offensive night, but he went out and he defended really, really well. He competed on the glass. He competed in transition, took care of the things that were in his control, and then some of the variant stuff also went his way, and he had a superstar-level performance. I want to talk about Russ for a second because, you know, you look at the box score. He has 10 points on 14 shots. He's 4 for 14 from the field. Only has four assists. Didn't close the game. I thought it was one of his best games of the, as a Laker. He completely changed the pace of the game when he came in in that second quarter. Obviously, he hit those two massive uh, shots at the end of the second quarter, or at the yeah, right before halftime, and right at the end of the third quarter. But even without those, he just did an outstanding job getting dribble penetration, playing with pace, generating high quality shots. There were some funky lineups, especially that one that I think he, I think it was the one he ended the third quarter with where he was legitimately out there without LeBron, without Anthony Davis, without Austin Reeves, and just a bunch of guys. And he, his ability to consistently beat his man off the dribble and get into the paint get, generated high-quality shots on the back end. You know, that's his job. His jo- and again, it's like the, the important thing for Russell Westbrook to figure out is it's not about box score results. It's not 18-9-7. and seven. What it is is play with, play with pace and energy, get consistent dribble penetration, and limit your mistakes. And that's what he did. There were maybe two or three shots that he took that I didn't like, a quick transition. Like, a couple of the early shots he took in his first quarter shift were tough. There was, like, a a quick pull-up three that I didn't like. He rushed a layup that he missed. But, you know, there's two or three mistakes in there. But he also had zero turnovers. So, in general, it was a low-mistake Russ game. Where, yeah, he was 4 for 14, but he generated a ton of dribble penetration, changed the feel and pace of the game. That's his job. That's Russell Westbrook's job. Now, I know a lot of Russ fans get concerned when he doesn't get to close, but the reality is is he's he becomes redundant at that point. And a lot of it has to do with how well LeBron's playing. When LeBron is playing like an MVP, which he did last night... You don't need Russ out there in crunch time because what you would rather have is good off-ball players who are better in off-ball situations on both ends of the floor. That way you don't have that redundancy, which kind of led to the problem on Monday night when you had Schroeder and LeBron and and Russ all in at the same time and the offense just went to hell uh, really quickly. But a really nice performance from Russ. and I, I thought it was a perfect example of what the Lakers need from him in ways that go beyond the box score. Austin Reeves. Career-high 22 points on 10 shots. He is really good at getting defenders out of position with pump fakes. I was watching last night, and I'm like, man, I swear he gets to the line so often. And so I did some research today. He leads the entire NBA, Austin Reeves does, in free throws made per game by players that are attempting fewer than seven shots per game. 
<laughs> so just, just uh, you know, it's funny. Uh, somebody of my buddy, Ralph, uh, another Lakers fan that I t- uh, talk to on Twitter sometimes, um, uh, mentioned that he was really good at drawing fouls when he was in college. And it just he just he just has a really natural feel for scoring and passing the basketball and in general feeling the floor, understanding where defenders are, when he needs to pump fake, when he doesn't. It's funny he pump fakes so frequently and he gets defenders uh, off of their out of their uh, like jumping out of their shoes and out of position so frequently that he can actually get shots off in traffic because guys become paranoid about jumping. He's turned himself into a damn good two way guard in this league. His on-ball creation is pretty legit. He's generated 68 points and 68 pick-and-rolls this year, which is in the 62nd percentile, so he's already an above-average pick-and-roll creator. He's generated 13 points on nine ISOs, so really good, albeit slow vol- uh, low volume. And then he's an excellent spot-up threat. He's scored 82 points in 62 spot-up possessions, 58% on two-point jump shots, 40% on three-point jump shots. So shout out to Austin Reeves. He's been playing some really good basketball lately. Lakers have won six out of eight. Yes, it should be seven out of eight, but it is what it is. During this eight-game stretch, they are sixth in offense, fourth in defense, and fifth in net, in net rating. The schedule has been light, but they're also playing good basketball. during this, uh, For the season, they are now up to the second-best half-court defense in the league, like we mentioned earlier. Um, they are dead last in transition defense, though. So again, they're stars making good decisions. You know, uh, when they miss shots around the rim, that's fine. But sprinting back instead of complaining at the refs, just in general, uh, jogging back in transition instead of sprinting. When their stars are on top of their transition defense stuff, they can trap other teams in the half court, and then they can win games because of how good their half court defense is. Really, is about the stars. When the stars are sharp, the Lakers win. Everyone's going to point to the schedule, and yes, it's been really weak, as they should. You should point to the schedule. But you have Milwaukee on Friday, and then December is full of games that are opportunities to prove to everyone that the Lakers are for real. So go do it. You know, If you don't want anybody to pull out the schedule as an excuse, go beat the Bucs on Friday, and uh, that's going to be a fun game. I'm looking forward to covering it. All right, guys, that is all I have for today. As always, I sincerely appreciate your support, and I will see you guys tomorrow for our quarter season awards.